You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and for this show I've got five movies to review for you, but first I'm going to get into my normal segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And we've got a couple of surprises, a few upsets, and I did predict last week that Cars 3 would outseat Wonder Woman for the number one spot of the box office. Turns out I was actually correct. The rest of the predictions I made were probably incorrect, but I kept a lot of those predictions last week in my head. So Cars 3 debuts at number one at the box office, which is actually typical for a Pixar film, but it's debatable whether or not Cars 3 will stay there next week. I can't exactly say for sure. I can never say for sure, but I can always make my best guess. Anyway, this weekend, Cars 3 grossed $53.7 million in the U.S., and that's against a budget of $175 million. Around the world, it has grossed $75 million. That means it is neither a hit here in the States or overseas yet, but it is well on its way to being so. Wonder Woman, on the other hand, is number two at the box office, falling from number one last week, where it was for the last two weeks. This weekend, it grossed $41.3 million. Against a budget of $149 million, Wonder Woman has so far grossed $275.1 million in just the United States in only three weeks. Around the world, it has so far grossed 50, excuse me, $573.5 million, which means it is a tentative hit here in the States, but very, very close to being a certified hit. Around the world, it is already certified. All Eyes on Me is the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, and it's number three at the box office this weekend, having made a pretty decent $26.4 million at the U.S. box office this weekend, and that is against a relatively modest budget of $40 million. So it's not a hit yet, but it is very close to being so. I don't have the international numbers for that movie just yet. I may by next week. We'll see. The Mummy was number two at the box office last week and not off to a great start money-wise. This week, it dropped to number four, having only made $14.5 million. Against a budget of $125 million, The Mummy has so far made, in just the United States, $57.1 million, which means it is not even close to a hit yet here in the States. However, the staggering part is that around the world, The Mummy has grossed $294 million, which means that Tom Cruise is still a big box office draw around the world. Here in the United States, not so much, but... Also, The Mummy's getting some, been getting some pretty bad reviews. I gave it a less than stellar review. I didn't give it a terrible review, but there were some things that were definitely wrong with this movie. But moving on. Number five at the box office is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, and that is 47 Meters Down. 47 Meters Down grossed $11.2 million this weekend, and that is against a relatively modest budget of $5 million. So in just one weekend, 47 Meters Down has grossed more than twice its budget, which makes it a certified hit already here in the States. I don't have the international numbers for you right now, but... Vicariously, by being a certified hit here in the States, it is also a certified hit worldwide, even if it made no money in any other country in which it was released, which is doubtful. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, is number six of the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number four last week in its fourth week in release. This weekend it grossed $9 million. Against a very hefty budget of $230 million, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, has so far grossed $150.6 million here in the States and $651.2 million around the world. So Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, has, is not a hit yet. It's about $80 million short of being a tentative hit here in the States. But very much like The Mummy, it has made its bread and butter in every other country around the world besides the United States. And is a certified hit around the world. 
Rough Night is the number four highest grossing debut movie of the week, but is off to a very rough start here in the United States and actually probably around the world too. As it is debuted at number seven at the box office this weekend, earning just $8 million at the box office in the United States, and that is against a budget of $20 million. So it doesn't have a huge budget, unlike The Mummy or Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, but it is off to a pretty rough start, if I didn't say that already. And Rough Night Around the World has so far grossed $12.2 million, which means it's neither a hit here in the States or around the world, but chances are it will at least be a tentative hit here in the States. At least I'm guessing. Captain Underpants, the first epic movie in its third week in release, is number eight at the box office, and this took the biggest drop because last week it was number three at the box office. But Captain Underpants, the first epic movie, grossed a decent $7.2 million against a modest budget of $38 million, which is modest for an animated movie, especially one from DreamWorks. Captain Underpants has so far grossed $57.8 million here in the States and $62.7 million around the world. So it's not doing a, a lot of good in every other country besides the United States, but it is a tentative hit here in the States and a tentative hit around the world, so it's off to a relatively good start, especially given its budget. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is still hanging in there at number 9 at the box office, sliding actually quite a bit from number 5 last week. But in its 7th week in release, it grossed $5.1 million at the box office this weekend. Against a budget of $200 million, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has so far grossed $374.9 million here in the States and $844.7 million around the world. So don't be surprised if this breaks the $1 billion mark as other Disney movies have done so far this year, but as of now, it's a tentative hit here in the States and most certainly a certified hit around the world. It Comes at Night is number 10 at the box office this weekend, having made $2.6 million just this weekend. Against a budget of $5 million, It Comes at Night has made $11.1 .1 million in the United States so far. I don't have the international numbers for you right now, but I can tell you that It Comes at Night in the United States is a certified hit. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Cars 3. This is, of course, the sequel or the... the the third entry into the Cars franchise, which is probably one of the most divisive, shall we say, franchises in the Disney Pixar canon. So, of course, the first two Cars movies have made quite a bit of money, but, well, a lot of people consider Cars 2 the quote-unquote worst of the Disney Pixar films, and that might be true, but... Pixar's worst is probably better than Illumination Studios or Blue Sky Studios' best, arguably. But I still had a good time watching Cars 3, and this time Lightning McQueen, unlike in the first mover, movie where he was the rookie race car of the year, now finds himself in the shoes of his mentor, that, his mentor being the car that Paul Newman voiced in the original Cars movie. The name of that car is Doc. Doc, um, I, I, I can't find the uh, last name right now, but yeah, rather than Lightning McQueen being the cocky new upstart, he is now a veteran in the Indy 500, and he sets out to prove a new generation of racers that he's still the best race car in the world. But of course, starting over does not come easy, as when he's in the Piston Cup, Lightning McQueen and his fellow veteran racers find themselves overshadowed by a new race of race cars that are that use the latest technology to boost their performance. Primarily, the the new cocky rookie is a car named Jackson Storm, who's voiced in this movie by Army Hammer. Well, Lightning McQueen takes on Jackson Storm and his other new generation race cars, and eventually. Lightning McQueen is the only one of the older racers who has not retired yet. However, during the final race of the season, 
Lightning, of course, tries to win, but he lose, loses control and suffers a violent rollover crash. So what happens is Lightning McQueen goes back to Radiator Springs, and he watches footage of the crash that ended the career of his late mentor, Doc, as I said, and I found out his last name, Doc Hudson, who in the original movie was voiced by Paul Newman. And I guess they took some clips of Paul Newman's voice that landed on the cutting room floor and put them into this movie, which was actually a pretty wise move. I would not have known that Paul Newman is no longer with us if I only had Cars 3 to go on as an indication. But anyway... Once Lightning recovers from this crash, which somehow does not end his career, even though it looks eerily similar to Doc Hudson's crash, he decides he doesn't want to be forced into retirement, and he actually starts to train again with a very ambitious uh, entrepreneur that builds a state-of-the-art training facility, where he is put together with, or rather, teamed together with a trainer by the name of Cruz Ramirez, who is voiced in this movie by stand-up comedian Cristela Alonso. And there's actually some good back and forth going on between Cruz Ramirez and Lightning McQueen. Of course, Lightning McQueen is not exactly as old as Doc Hudson. He's not exactly grisly or ready to just throw in the towel. He's still very ambitious, but he's also one of those cars who still thinks he knows everything. So he works very well alongside the opposite personality of Cruz Ramirez, who actually kind of reminded me a little bit of one of those, one of those, shall we say, those fitness trainers who have, a lot of perk and a lot of enthusiasm. And, well, anyway, Cristela Alonso does well voicing Cruz Ramirez. And eventually you learn a little bit more about the character Cruz, whose first name is spelled C-R-U-Z, but I think it was meant to intentionally sound like C-R-U-I-S-E as a, a clever pun. But anyway, I'll take it. But anyway... Lightning McQueen eventually finds, without giving too much away, that this fitness facility is not to his liking, and eventually he goes back to Doc Hudson's original home where he finds his trainer, Smokey, played by Chris Cooper, who begins to teach him a thing or two about training the old-fashioned way. So in this respect, Cars 3 begins to emulate, I think, whether intentionally or not, the plot of Rocky IV, where you have Rocky, who is training in the woods, in the snow, right before Christmas, before taking on Ivan Drago, who, in contrast, is in a state-of-the-art facility where he is being trained on, on the latest machines and is also taking steroids. So there's Rocky doing things the old-fashioned way, not only the old-fashioned way, but the more organic way, whereas Ivan Drago is being trained almost like a robot. So... There's that contrast here, and admittedly, I had a few problems with this movie. I didn't hate it, but I did think that Jackson Storm, voiced by Army Hammer, wasn't a particularly good villain, or at least you didn't see very much of him. Of course, he's ambitious and, of course, a little cocky, but that's not a reason to hate um, an antagonist, and I felt like I should have hated that character. I was also very tired of some characters, especially Mater, who's voiced again by Larry the Cable Guy. And whenever Mater shouted to another character, Get her done! Which he actually does, I counted three times in this movie, I began to think, Larry, it's not 2004 anymore. That that catchphrase isn't funny. But I, I did think that the animation in Cars 3 was pretty good. I wouldn't put this along the best Pixar movies like either Finding Nemo movie or any of the Toy Story, any of the Toy Story films, but I give it my rating of a very high checkout. I do think that the story could have been less predictable, and there were elements that made it actually quite predictable. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is the long-awaited Tupac Shakur biopic, All Eyes on Me. This is a movie that that took that has been in the basically production hell for years, due in large part to 
Tupac Shakur's mother not signing off on the rights to Tupac's long-awaited biopic. I guess because of some creative differences with filmmakers that have tried to put Tupac's life on film. Well, now it is on film, and I think the wait was very well worth it. I think we have somebody here who's playing Tupac Shakur, who's a newcomer. This guy has not only had a, who's never had a starring role in a film before this, he has also never been in a movie period before joining this movie. And not only does he look almost exactly like Tupac Shakur, but his acting is really, really good. I felt like I was watching Tupac Shakur as opposed to someone who was just playing him. But the, guy, the actor who plays Tupac Shakur in this movie is Demetrius Ship Jr., who surprisingly is not actually related to Tupac. However, he actually does have a connection to Tupac because Demetrius Ship Jr.'s father, who I guess is Demetrius Ship Sr., produced the track Toss It Up, for Tupac Shakur's last album when he was alive, where Tupac Shakur went under the name Machiavelli, and I never exactly understood why, but the album was called The Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory. And that was Tupac Shakur's last album, allegedly, while he was still alive. It actually came out two months after Tupac Shakur's death, but it was all finished by the time Tupac passed on. But this film is what you'd expect. It tells the true and untold story, or mostly, or partially untold story, of the prolific actor, rapper, poet, and activist who died very young at the age of 25, but before he died, he had released five studio albums, had been in seven movies, and sold five million albums total. That was just when he was alive. When he died, a couple, I think about five other albums were released after he died, which I, I guess, depending on what conspiracy theory you hear, might have been released or might have been recorded before he died or before he allegedly died because his death is still in the, is, is still open to questioning. And, and even me, I, I st I'm still not entirely convinced Tupac's dead, but this movie, All Eyes on Me, does not delve in any conspiracy theories like that. But, the point I was trying to get at is when you take all his 12, all 12 of his albums, the five he released when he died, and I think the seven he released after he died, he has sold 25 million albums total, 20 million after his second shooting. So this movie gets into just about everything that made Tupac unique. It, and it also delves into his contradictions in his art. The fact that he did release a number of songs that were very profound and philosophical thought, but being labeled as a gangster rapper was not an accident. It, it does also delve into the contradictory nature of a lot of his music, particularly his more popular music, where he refers to women as bitches and hoes and also his intentional misspelling of lyrics but i i don't think it it paints a judgmental picture of tupac and it it probably i don't think it was expected to either i i think it details i i think a, a gr I, I think it gives you a vast look at his life in just two hours and 20 minutes. I think there, I do honestly think that there's enough interesting content in Tupac's life to be put into this movie and have it be a three and a half hour movie where nobody gets bored. And I think that's a testament both to the screenwriters of this movie, who are Jeremy Haft, Eddie Gonzalez, and one other person who I can't, okay. It, the script was written by Eddie Gonzalez, Steve, st excuse me, Stephen Bagatorian, who wrote the script together, and it was also given treatment by Jeremy Haft. So this wasn't based on a book, and I don't know if it was actually based on Tupac's writings or anything like that. I think the movie could have benefited from not only being a biopic, but also a docudrama where you actually got interviews from the people who knew Tupac best. 
such as his mother, such as Suge Knight, the founder and CEO of Def Jam Records, maybe Dr. Dre in there, Snoop Dogg. It doesn't have that, but the fact that it's not a docudrama doesn't take away from how impactful a movie this is. It is directed by uh, a director named Benny Boom, who is an African-American director, who's directed such films as 48 Hours to Live, which came out last year. He also directed SWAT Firefight, which came out in 2011. And he, other than that, he's directed a number of music videos. In fact, he's still directing music videos to this day by the likes of David Guetta, Nicki Minaj, Drake, Lil Wayne, you name it. So very much like F. Gary Gray, Benny Boom is a music video director who tried his hand at directing a movie based on a true story and very much like F. Gary Gray, he succeeds. In fact, I would probably say that in terms of acting, All Eyes on Me actually is much better, surprisingly enough, than and the, the NWA film Straight Outta Compton. I know it's kind of sacrilegious to say that because Straight Outta Compton did get great reviews, and I did think overall that was a very consistent movie. However, some of the acting in that movie, particularly by the actor who played Dr. Dre, was not as good as it was in this movie. And I do think that... Demetrius Ship Jr. did a fantastic job in this film. Also of note is Dene Guerrera, who you might know from The Walking Dead, amongst other movies and TV shows, who plays Tupac's mother, Athene Shakur. I, I thought both, not only did she do really well in this movie, but she also worked very well alongside Demetrius Ship Jr. I wish I had more than 10 seconds to talk about the film, but it gets my rating of a knockout. It is the best biopic of the year so far. I had a great time watching it, and I actually do wish it was longer. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Rough Night. This is the latest starring Scarlett Johansson in addition to Jillian Bell, Kate McKinnon, Zoe Kravitz, and a relative newcomer to film at least, uh, Alana Glazer, who is not particularly known for her film acting, but she has appeared in a few films, but you would probably recognize her best as the co-star and co-creator of Comedy Central's Broad City. Now, I haven't seen that show, but I hear very good things about it. However, if you only know Ilana Glazer from this movie, well, then you'd probably want to watch something better she's in because Rough Night, I'm just going to tell you from the onset, is a good-looking film, but it's not good. (laughs) So the tagline for this film is Five Good Friends, One Terrible Mistake. And to... be at the risk of sounding like an embittered film critic, my one terrible mistake is sitting through this movie because it is just flat out not funny. So the movie is about a bachelorette party gone wrong. The bachelorette in this case is a young woman whose name is Jess, and she's played by Scarlett Johansson. So Jess is running for state senate, and she's also engaged to be married. So She's running for state senate in Washington, D.C., or maybe she's running for U.S. Senate. I, I can't exactly remember. Either way, she's running for a high office, and her, one of her best friends from college, Alice, who's played by Jillian Bell, is, I think she might be the maid of honor. I, I don't exactly know. That wasn't particularly well established in this film. But anyway, she plans for her, Jess, and three other friends some from college, another one who is a friend of Jess's from Australia, to get together and party hard for a weekend in Miami before Jess ties the knot with her fiancé, Peter, who's played in a relatively uninspired performance by Paul W. Downs, although Paul Downs is not the only reason this movie sucks. So the, the Australian film, excuse me, the Australian friend in this movie is not actually Australian in real life. I wouldn't exactly have a problem with that. Her name is Pippa, and she's played by Kate McKinnon, who you definitely know from Saturday Night Live. She, I, I think if you were to rank the top five funniest women on SNL in the show's history, Kate McKinnon would already be in the top five, maybe at number three or number four, because it's really hard to top Gilda Radner and 
Kristen Wiig, but if I were to make that list, I'd make it for another time. Not now. But in this movie, I can see that Kate McKinnon is trying her best, but her Australian accent slips so much that it makes me wonder why the filmmakers didn't actually hire an Australian a actress. Maybe not somebody as high profile as Margot Robbie or Rose Byrne, but maybe Rebel Wilson. Or if not Rebel Wilson, they could have found any other Australian comedic actress in L.A. to fill this role. But unfortunately, that, that's not the only problem with this film. The real problem with this movie is that it's just not funny. In addition to that, the one terrible thing that goes wrong here, I'm just going to tell you because it's not... A spoiler or anything the friends hire a male stripper for Scarlett Johansson's character and when they go to their Miami townhouse which they're renting out via Airbnb I guess the male stripper comes he strips for them and eventually he knocks his head so hard against a chip or a, a fireplace that his head starts bleeding and he dies instantly so if this sounds even the most vaguely familiar to you in terms of plot it's probably because it is actually the plot of another movie with the genders reversed i don't know if you remember back in 1998 but there was a film that came out called very bad things it starred john favreau before he became a household name and certainly before he directed two of the iron man movies it also starred cameron diaz christian slater jeremy piven daniel stern and basically, the setup was exactly this. There are all these guys who go to, well, in that movie, it was Vegas for a bachelor party. They hire a stripper. They do a lot of cocaine. And the stripper dies accidentally. So the rest of the movie is basically all these guys panicking and screaming at one another. And it's, it doesn't get any funnier. In fact, I was watching this movie with my parents around the time it first came out on video, and I didn't actually see the end of the film because 30 minutes into it, my mom wanted to shut it off, and I didn't blame her. I, I didn't think it was a very good film, and unfortunately, this film following the exact same premise of a movie that's not very good to begin with, I, I think practically kills the film. And the, the other thing is, this film is not marketed or even given credit as being a remake of very bad things and very bad things was not a good movie and i'm always a proponent of hollywood remaking bad movies as opposed to good movies because good movies if they're good why remake them that was the big problem i had with the live action version of beauty and the beast earlier this year it, it was remaking a great movie but here it's, it's not even acknowledging the, its, its resemblance to very bad things, of which there are several. But my main problem with this movie is it tackles a very dark subject, it doesn't do it very well, and there are characters in this film who are allegedly intelligent, like Scarlett Johansson's character, who do very dumb things to cover up this accidental murder. And, or rather something that probably could be considered at worst involuntary manslaughter. But th they do these five characters work together extremely illogically, and they're also primarily not funny. I might have chuckled three times during this film, but I chuckled. There really wasn't much left. There's also some side characters who were played by Demi Moore and Ty Burrell, who play this nymphomaniac couple. And not even they were funny. Even Ty Burrell, I would expect to be funny. But the, the main reason this movie isn't funny is not because of the actors. Jillian Bell and Kate McKinnon and I especially find funny. But there is very little to work with here. The plot is entirely predictable. And it gets my very low rating of a flunk out. It's not a movie I completely hated, but it is totally not worth recommending. Good looking, but very void of laughs. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and just as a reminder, you are either listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching me on Somerville Community Access TV or some local community TV affiliate, 
which has picked up my show. Thank you very much. Or you are watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Facebook or excuse me, on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is 47 Meters Down. Now, when I was going into my, my segment that I was doing last week, that's called What's Coming Up Next, which gives you a, a preview, or at least a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out the coming weekend, I did say that I suspected that 47 meters down was going to be a Jaws knockoff. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I wanted this movie to prove me wrong, and fortunately it did. It does have some things in common with Jaws, like the fact that there are sharks in this movie and the sharks pose a threat to humans, because if they didn't pose a threat to humans, what kind of movie would it be? I guess a family picture, but regardless... 47 Meters Down is about two sisters whose names are Kate and Lisa, who are played by Claire Holt and Mandy Moore, respectively. And they are they vacation in Mexico, and they go on an expedition where they scuba dive. And what, what they do is they get into a shark cage, and they're supposed to be brought down just five meters below the ocean's surface or rather the, the, the water surface, but because of a malfunction, they find that their shark cage is plunging 47 meters below the ocean. So I can't exactly, I, I probably could take some time to convert 47 meters into feet for you, but I didn't think to do that before starting the segment. But 47 meters down is a long way down. Too long, in fact, for them to have communications with the, with, with the boat up on the, the surface of the water. So with less than an hour of oxygen left and great white sharks circling nearby, these two sisters must fight to survive. And I got to say that 47 meters down was a very pleasant surprise for me in the fact that there were various moments in this movie where I was literally holding my breath. In fact, I hadn't been, I probably hadn't gripped the sides of my chair as much since the time that I saw gravity. And it's a 47 meters down, very much like gravity. It's probably not at the level of gravity in terms of, of filmmaking, but gravity is a very high bar over which to pass. And 47 meters down was just made on a budget of $5 million. The fact that they, did, excuse me, the fact that they could do as much as they did with $5 million for this movie is a testament to the filmmakers, who include director Johannes Roberts. And unfortunately, my internet's a little slow right now, so I can't tell you what other films that Johannes Roberts has done, but he co-wrote this film along with Ernest Riera. And as I said, it takes place in Mexico. And when the sisters get trapped underneath the water in this cage, there are several intense moments. And remember that they do have an less than an hour of oxygen left in their scuba diving gear. And well, if, if they, if they didn't have the scuba diving gear, they probably wouldn't have been in this cage. Cause that would, would be way too much of a liability, which might seem obvious for a lot of people who go on the beach a lot more than I do. But to them, I just say, shut up. But as I said, it's not just that they're trapped in this cage. In fact, the cage is keeping them safe from the sharks that abound. But eventually they find that they actually have to get out of that cage in order to communicate better with the people up in the boat. And actually, there are some compelling plot points in this film, including some, I think, reasonable scientific reasons behind, well, if they're trapped in this cage, why don't they just swim to the top? And this is something I wasn't even aware of. Apparently, when you go from 47 meters below the surface of, or before, if you go 47 meters below the water's surface and go straight up, apparently you get something called the bends, which I was thinking was something a lot grosser than it actually was, but it's still pretty dangerous. But the bends is when you get oxygen bubbles 
in your head that could trigger a brain hemorrhage. So that's the thing that's that's the primary thing that's preventing both of these ladies from just getting out of the cage and shooting up. I thought it was a compelling p- plot point. In addition to that, thankfully the people who are in the boat realize that the two sisters are trapped underneath there and they do send more oxygen tanks down, which is quite a relief, but there's also a warning that when they switch from one oxygen tank to another, that creates this nitric chemical reaction that results in the people who switch from one oxygen tank to another getting very vivid hallucinations. And there are some, I I can't give away the plot, but either way, it is extremely intense what happens both when they actually make that drop down to the ocean floor and also when they try to get back up again. A lot of very intense stuff happens. And eventually they do get out of the cage for moments, but there are times where I really feared for both of these women's safeties. And I would probably say that (laughs) it's really hard to, to fathom what it's like to be trapped in this certain situation. I did actually take comfort in knowing that I was in a theater and I had air to breathe and a lot of space. So when I assured myself of that, I felt better. But I think anyone who watches this film is probably going to be as panicked for these two women as I was. And it's for that reason that 47 meters down gets my rating of a knockout. You would think that because there are sharks in it, you would, you would think it would be a knockoff of Jaws, but it really isn't. It might have some things in common with Jaws, but honestly, go into this film with an open mind and you will be thrilled. Two words on film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Beatriz at Dinner. This is a somewhat small indie film. In fact, let me see if I can find the budget for this movie. It wasn't in the top 10, so I don't know exactly what the budget is, and I don't have information for the budget right now. I I could look it up, but I'm trying to avoid dead air as much as possible. But it is a a small-ish indie film. It actually has a number of very well-known actors in it, most notably Salma Hayek, who plays the titular Beatrice. It also stars Connie Britton, Chloe Sevigny, John Lithgow, and others. And Salma Hayek plays Beatriz, who is a holistic medicine practitioner who is a native of Mexico but has immigrated legally, and I I should note legally, to the United States where she's been for a while. And by accident, almost, she attends a wealthy client's dinner party after her car breaks down. So it's one of those instances where this holistic medicine medicine practitioner who is also a masseuse, maybe even vicariously a masseuse, goes to this wealthy client's house to give this client a massage and then finds that she's leaving and her car won't start. So when she's awaiting an acquaintance of hers to come to the house to fix the car and get her going again, her wealthy client, who's played by Connie Britton, and whose, whose name in this movie is Kathy, um, invites her very politely to a dinner party she's having with other wealthy visitors, probably most notably a hotel mogul whose name is Doug Strutt, who's played in this movie by John Lithgow. Now, when I say it's a hotel mogul, I am very reluctant to say that John Lithgow in this movie is like Donald Trump. John Lithgow is a lot more dignified in his performance and probably even in real life than Donald Trump could ever dream of being. But that's not to say that his character, Doug Strutt, is not without his controversy. He is a hotel magnate, and he has built hotels all around the world, it seems, including in Salma Hayek's native Mexico. So... Salma Hayek's character comes from a small town in Mexico, and the name of the town is actually quite long. In fact, that's another thing I could look up right now, but it's a name that has 
five syllables and or maybe four syllables and it's pretty hard to pronounce but either way you eventually find from the conversation that beatrice has with these people that doug strutt allegedly built a hotel in her hometown or began to build a hotel that was promised to create jobs but eventually the plans for the hotel were scrapped and what resulted was that the town went downhill financially and became crime ridden or at least according to Salma Hayek's character there is a lot going on here and especially subtly of, of course Salma Hayek is not only the only person of color at this dinner table but she's also the only non anglo-saxon of the people at this dinner table so of course she understandably feels out of place not to mention she's not she's dressed for work not for a dinner party so there's that sort of awkward tension that goes on throughout the film and connie Britton is good at playing someone who is very nice and very accommodating but also can't quite put salma hayek's character comfortably in the situation no matter how hard she tries so what's interesting is this film was directed by miguel arteta and written by mike white and i'm not sure if mike white who is a caucasian american wrote this film with a Mexican woman or a person of color, let alone a Mexican woman in mind. I mean, it could have been, it could have been anybody, you know, of any race in this kind of role. It could have been a white person who's a little bit more blue collar than these white collar people, but it wouldn't have had the same effect. But the reason I say that it's significant that Miguel Arteta directed this and Mike White wrote it is this is, from my research, at least their third collaboration. They also collaborated together on movies such as Chuck and Buck, which starred Mike White. Mike White doesn't appear in this movie, but he had a prominent role in Chuck and Buck, which is an underrated masterpiece of a movie, I think. And... When you talk about awkward movies, Chuck and Buck is very, very awkward. They also work together on the Jennifer Aniston starring vehicle, The Good Girl, which I think is one of Jennifer Aniston's best performances. But what's great about Mike White and Miguel Arteta is not only do they make intriguing independent films, but they also find art in the awkward moments the quiet spaces in between conversations. And what I liked about Miguel Arteta's direction in this film was when he closed up on people's faces. And I think to the credit of actors like, especially Salma Hayek in this film, and John Lithgow to a certain extent, is they, their facial expressions say a lot, despite the fact that they may not say very much while the camera is close up on them. And I think that Miguel Arteta did a great job with n knowing when to close up on a character's, or have a close up on a character's face. And I, I think this, I've heard another reviewer say that this is the first great movie of the Donald Trump era. I don't quite know about that. It, it is a great movie, no doubt. And it does get my rating of a knockout, but I don't, necessarily think that it plays in particularly well with or at least it, it gels especially effectively with donald trump's controversial remarks about mexicans of course john lithgow's character doug strutt is a little presumptuous about salma hayek's character being mexican he does actually ask her offhand if she immigrated to this country legally, which is, of course, an audacious question to ask anybody. But <laughs> the fact that Doug Strutt in this film, John Lithgow's character, is more dignified than Donald Trump will ever be, 
it makes me reluctant to compare him to Trump. And now that I've reviewed all five movies that I have to review for this show, I'm now going to get into my next segment, What's Coming Up Next? These are the films that are coming out this coming weekend, some maybe even a little bit sooner. And I'm not saying whether these movies are good or bad because I haven't seen a lot of them, so I don't know. But I'll tell you what I think of them, and I'm also going to tell you whether or not I'm going to see them. So this is not... Also, not me saying, go see this movie or don't see this movie. Well, I'm just giving you my initial impressions of these films based on the storyline, the cast, and maybe a little bit of history behind them. So, here's what I'm going to tell you. The big film that's coming out this weekend is one I am not going to see, but I'm going to tell you all about it. The film is Transformers The Last Night, which is the fifth Transformers movie that's coming out. The reason I'm not seeing it is not necessarily because of the bad reputation that Michael Bay's Transformers movies have, although there's that. The other reason is I have not seen any of the other Transformers movies to date, not a single one. I guess my impression is that people liked the first Transformers movie, but every single one after that, critics and audiences, well, critics definitely hated it. Audiences for the most part, didn't like it, but the movie st still made a significant amount of money anyway, which is why they make sequels. So anyway, in Transformers The Last Night, which is the fifth Transformers movie in 10 years, so average one movie every two years, wrap your head behind or wrap your mind around that, humans and Transformers are at war and Optimus Prime is gone. The key to saving our future lies buried in the secrets of the past and the hidden history of Transformers on Earth. The movie stars Mark Wahlberg, Josh Duhamel, Laura Haddock, and Anthony Hopkins, and is directed by Michael Bay. So again, this is a movie I'm not going to see, but I'm not saying you can't see it. It's just not going to be a movie I'm going to review next week. Another movie that is coming out in wide release that I might see, depending on whether or not it's available, is a movie called Tube Light, which is the story of a man's unshakable faith in himself and the love for his family, which sounds very much like a vague title, but it is a movie from India that stars Salman Khan, Zuzu, Sohal Khan, and Mohammed Zishan Ayub. I don't know how that movie's going to be. I'm not even sure if I'm going to see it. I, I shouldn't be discriminatory against Indian films, but I, I think with the, the somewhat bad reputation that Indian films have in the sense that there are Bollywood films that come out that, that Bollywood in India keeps cranking out, I might see this. It doesn't sound like a typical Bollywood film, but from the Bollywood films I've seen, they all kind of seem the same. But Tube Light at least sounds a little bit interesting, even though the premise is vague. So I might see that. I might not. But... One movie I probably will see if it's coming out in theater near me is a movie called The Big Sick. This is a movie that's produced by Judd Apatow and directed by Michael Showalter. And it's a movie about an interracial couple who deals with their cultural differences as their relationship grows. So this is a movie that stars Kumal Nanjiani, who not only co-wrote this movie, but he's also one of those actors who you've probably seen in other movies before. The movie also stars Zoe Kazan, Holly Hunter, and Ray Romano, amongst other people. Now, this looks like a very interesting movie. It deals with an interracial marriage, and I think it deals with the complications, not only of it being interracial, but also being intercultural. And I'm very interested in seeing that, especially a white family mixing with an Indian family. That should be very interesting. And with Judd Apatow producing, it should also be funny. I can't say for sure, but I will see that movie and I'll let you know what I think. Another movie that's coming out, uh, I guess in wide release, is a movie called The Beguiled. The Beguiled is the latest from director Sofia Coppola. And it, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a movie that takes place at a girls' school in Virginia during the Civil War where the young women have been sheltered from the outside world. A wounded Union soldier is taken in. And soon the house is taken over with sexual tension, rivalries, and an unexpected turn of events. 
The movie stars Nicole Kidman, Kirsten Dunst, Elle Fanning, and Colin Farrell. And Kirsten Dunst has collaborated numerous times with director Sofia Coppola before, most notably in movies like The Virgin Suicides and another one, oh, Marie Antoinette. So I can't say whether this film is good or bad, but Sofia Coppola is a better director than she was an actress. So it's got to be an interesting family reunion in the Coppola household with Sofia Coppola directing The Beguiled and her mother, Eleanor Coppola, directing her first movie, which is, well, the, I forgot the title of it, but it's out in theaters right now. And, well, I definitely recommend that one. But anyway... That's all with Words on Film for this week. Again, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And stay tuned for Toppers with Gill coming up next. And I'll see you at the movies. Hey.